So, uh, yes. And please identify yourself. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hello, hello. DG. Uh, hello. Albert Otti, DPA, Chairman Price hello. Agency. I have a question about uh, what you said about North Korea today in the board. Yeah. yeah. Um, regarding the observations of the opening of a tunnel uh, yeah. at the nuclear test site. Yes. Um, first question, when did you observe that, the opening? Yeah. And what makes you think that the opening of the uh, tunnel might be a preparation to a test? Well, um, on the observation, I think we, we've been having regular uh, updates of uh, the imagery, which uh, seem to indicate and to confirm uh, the activity around uh, this addit where uh, the activity is taking place. And the fact that uh, uh, the assessment of the expert um, is that is because this is consistent with similar uh, activity uh, and images previous to um, other uh, tests uh, taken place in, in the DPRK uh, in, on past occasions. Of course, this is an assessment and prognosis. We cannot say for sure, but it's pretty consistent. <coughs> Hi, Raghida Bahnam from Al Arabiya TV. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask on Iran. Uh, we all know that there's a resolution that will be voted on uh, within this week. Uh, and you expressed worry that Iran is not cooperating with you. Uh, but Iran, on the other hand, said that will, they will respond in case that there was such a resolution. Do you not worry that such a resolution might have a counter effect on your work and Iran might maybe cut all ties and not allow you any access anymore? Well, of course, is it, uh, there's a bit of uh, speculation in, the, in your question. Uh, the uh, resolution, as you know, is a matter of member states. I'm not behind or in favor or against. Resolutions are things that countries decide to do uh, when they feel that the board needs to express its voice on, on something. Uh, on the um, possible actions that might be taken, well, we, we will see uh, when, uh, when that happens. I believe that it, it's in no one's interest that the cooperation between the agency and Iran diminishes even further. So I, I hope that this will not be the case. And on the contrary, as I said, this will be um, uh, a reminder for Iran and for us and for everybody that we really need to get uh, down to work and clarify these issues that have been outstanding for, for too long. Hi, DG. Francois Hello. Murphy from Reuters. Hi. Hello. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we've become used to seeing you going to Tehran shortly before mm -hmm. uh, board meetings like this one. Um, uh, but you didn't do that this time. Uh, you went to Israel uh, instead. So how, how are we to interpret that? What's the message that you were sending there, uh, given that Israel has carried out attacks against, or appears to have carried out attacks against Iran's nuclear facilities, yeah. yes. et cetera, et cetera? Well, no message, absolutely no message. I am doing what I need to do. Uh, it is true, like you are recalling, um, uh, on previous occasions and near or close to the sessions of Board of Governors, uh, there were um, invitations from Iran for me to come and try to um, have some uh, 11th hour agreement on this and that. On this occasion, I don't know about their motivations, but what I could say from the strictly process point of view, um, there was very little we could add uh, since we had, in fact, implemented what we had decided in one of these trips um, back in February, March, uh, where we had this uh, joint statement with Mr. Eslami, and then we decided how we were going to work, and the results are uh, what they are, and what you have seen in my in my report. So it is not that I decided not to go. First of all, I was not invited. And I believed uh, I could have manifested my intention to go. But I thought that at this stage, uh, we have completed a process. I think we have to sit down urgently, if possible, and see uh, how we continue with this. Uh, so, uh, as I said, there is no um, travel agenda messaging here. Um, whatsoever, no. 
So well, since you mentioned the process, um, so uh, are you essentially saying that this discussion that you created for three months, this three months timeline, so essentially that's come to an end and now you tr you're hoping well, uh, to we provide we something else? We, we have to recognize that we have not been able to get the results we were expecting. And I think my reports are, are quite clear, quite graphic. I've, I've, I've been trying to put clarity in the reports, so there, there is, you know, very, very, it's very, very obvious uh, what was done and why um, we believe that what has been said to us is technically not, not credible or the information is simply not there. So at the end of this line, we say, okay, well, uh, this is where we are. The issues are outstanding. You, you, have, you may have also noted that I have a refrain for getting into uh, a definitive uh, language or assessments uh, to the effect that there is nothing more to be. Of course, we have to always, always continue uh, until we can clarify this. I don't see any other way, to be, to be honest. So let's see. Um, I think the deliberations of member states now are due. Countries are going to express their views on the matter, including Iran, and starting maybe from, 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 from Iran. And then uh, we will have to, this, these issues will not go away. They are not solved, they are not clarified. I, I know you don't take a view on, on whether there should be a resolution, but do you think a resolution could change anything in this dialogue you're trying to have with Iran? And I think we need, we need to uh, continue working with Iran we, and with a sense of, uh, of uh, finality. Uh, what we got from, from them is, is clearly not sufficient or it's inadequate. Uh, so with this, we cannot move forward. And the, the, the problem here is that uh, Iran uh, needs to continue working with us. They have a very important, very ambitious nuclear program, as you know. Uh, and, and now their declarations are in question because there are loopholes, there are doubts, uh, which are relatively important. So I think it's in their own interest to, to, to clear this uh, in order to continue. There is no other way, to be, to be honest, there is no other way. Thanks, DG. Hello. Hi. Hi. I have a couple questions yes. that are non-Iran related. Uh, one on Aukus and yeah. one on nuclear safety. I'll take the one at a time if I can. Please. You mentioned ABAK in the consultations going yes. on uh, yeah. relation to the mm -hmm. withdrawal of special fissionable ma yeah. material to power a mm -hmm. Brazilian nuclear submarine. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a little bit more detail on the kind of interfaces <coughs> ABAK is having with the agency right now? and? How is it that two countries that are outside of the additional protocol are going to be informing best practices about exercising InfoCERC 153 um, paragraph 14? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an uh, unusual circumstance, is it not? No, it's not unusual, starting by the last one, because uh, the uh, na naval propulsion is covered by the quadripartite agreement. So they are strictly... Uh, within the normative structure, if you if you wish, um, if you if you want, sorry. Uh, so uh, I don't see that. Uh, the, the 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 other parts of your question are, are more of a value judgment sort of uh, nature, which uh, you know I hope they, they every country signs an additional protocol and subscribes to an additional protocol. Uh, but in this particular case, there is uh, Article 14 of the Quadripartite Agreement, which is more or less a copy of 13 of the normal CSA. And, and Brazil, in this particular case, has invoked that. So we are in the be at the beginning uh, of the process. We are just at the beginning. They have formally, which is very important, uh, they have formally invoked the, um, the provisions of this uh, article that says that they are intending to exclude some material at some point in the future for this purpose. So now we start the process of working on the special ag ag agreements or arrangements that are necessary for them to be able to do that. Right, just to follow up briefly, but th I mean, this could be something that is important for informing a broader international discussion over AUKUS as well. Yes. Uh, I would assume, yes? Well, the, this, uh, it's, it's very interesting because frankly speaking, um, and if I can use uh, a, maritime analo a maritime analogy, we, these are uncharted waters. It has never been done before. 
So I think here you will have a very interesting convergence of uh, legal matters, uh, how they apply, and also uh, technical, because uh, many things that we will be doing will depend on the technical paths that they take to get mm -hmm. to the reactors that they want. And as you know, there are different options, uh, existing options and future ones that can, can, can apply. And the two projects are, are, have similarities, but also have profound differences. So I think it's like we are going to, to, uh, to be building our own, our own road as, 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 as we move uh, forward. Okay, and then just on the nuclear safety side, obviously you've been um, highlighting the very novel uh, safety situation in Ukraine where yeah. reactors are operating in the theater yeah. of conflict. Yeah. But yet we've known since at least 2020 that the Pentagon and Westinghouse are developing <clears throat> Project Pele, which explicitly is designing an SMR for battlefield use. So my question is, since we've known by tw since 2020 that reactors are being developed for <coughs> theaters of conflict, why hasn't the IAEA already begun the process of developing a safety standard to help inform the best practices of safely operating a reactor in a theater of conflict? What kind of contact groups with military officials, for example, would be needed? And you know, what's the status of that thought process here? Well, I can tell you, uh, setting aside the specific um, uh, war theater uh, adaptable uh, reactor issue, which is a very, very uh, unique uh, case, uh, there is and there are a number of groups, including uh, within the agency of uh, uh, regulatory nature, dealing with uh, standards for SMRs. Uh, so that is already underway, and I have uh, very recently launched yet another initi initiative, which is called NESI, for uh, Nuclear Harmonization Standardization, blah, blah, initiative, where we are bringing together, uh, for the first time, I would say, this is interesting, industry, this private sector, we are going to start in a couple of weeks, and the regulators from all over the world, to see how we can uh, work in a more, I would say, um, dedicated way and, and, and looking into the concrete problems dealing with, uh, um, um, sorry, um, regulatory licensing, pre-licensing approaches, and on the other side, on the industry, what can be standardized or not, etc. So I think uh, there is, there is a reasonable amount of work which is uh, which is uh, ongoing. I wouldn't say there is a vacuum uh, there. Hold on, that was an artful dodge, but you answered my I question. Tried to, yes. you, you answered my question with a response about SMR regulation, which is fine. But I was asking specifically about operating reactors intentionally inside of a theater of conflict and whether or not there needs to be safety standards about how best to do that. You know, I mean, are, do, 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 do you operate reactors at full capacity? Do you need to inform uh, uh, military commanders? Uh, well, uh, I mean, what? As you know, the issue of the protection of nuclear installations in general, be it small, medium size, or big size, um, has been dealt with in, in international law in general. So, uh, um, and, and uh, uh, given that fact, um, I don't see a movement in industry to uh, prepare uh, reactors that would be fit for battlefield. This is not a trend that I see. There could be one or the other, uh, like you are mentioning, idea here. But frankly, I don't see uh, countries, uh, economies, looking into their energy infrastructure, bearing in mind or uh, factoring in war as an element, um, and actually uh, an, uh, another important element which, which is uh, relevant in this case, it is not a, as a result of war, but uh, the, as you know very well, the physical integrity of reactors as a result of uh, nuclear, ter I mean terrorism, not nuclear terrorism, in the early 2000s uh, was uh, very, very much um, strengthened, not thinking about conventional type war, 
but and then we have the physical protection that uh, exists now, which is pretty uh, adequate even for situations like this. I don't want to imply that uh, this is ideal. It's a very terrible, dangerous situation about which we are, I am bringing the alarm bell constantly, in particular when it regards to Saporizia. Uh, but um, yeah, I hope yeah. that is so, so. No safety. There's no safety standard in in in, in, in progress. There mm -hmm. are safety standards that may apply to conflict right. situations, but there are no safety standards there's, under a title war. There's no new safety standards no. that have been started since the Ukraine war. Okay. No. Good. No. Hi, it's Stephanie Lichtenstein, Hello. freelance journalist. Hello. Um, I would, would have one question on your trip to Israel and another specific yes. question on, on Iran also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, given, given the large amount of highly enriched uranium uh, that Iran has accumulated, according to your reports, yes. um, some experts say that there's now a risk um, <coughs> that basically Iran could dash to um, uh, enough material for one bomb in between inspections, also given the fact that your inspections are quite limited at the moment, how concerned are you about this? And is this, according to your view, a real um, possibility? And um, the second question on your trip to Israel, um, we all, probably all of us, have read uh, reports in Wall Street Journal about internal documents that Iran obtained two mm -hmm. decades ago, um, <laughs> uh, allegedly to evade yeah. uh, inspections and to um, maybe deceive the agency. I was wondering if you discussed the matter, if you gained any further insights um, on this. Um, okay. Yeah, thank uh, you. No, very simple. We did not discuss. On the second we, question, We did not no. discuss this. As you know, this is an old story. This is, uh, these things happened, uh, I believe, uh, around f 15 years ago or something like that. Uh, so, uh, no, the, the matter was not discussed, and, uh, and of course, that was a regrettable episode if, if it happened and how it happened. There were some investigations, but none to identify clearly how this could have happened. Since then, the, uh, confident, the protection of confidential information has uh, increased <coughs> dramatically in general, and in particular at the agency as well. Regarding the, uh, the amounts of material, I would say there is no need for do th things between inspections. This is going to happen because they continue to enrich um, uh, in a quite sustained way. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, time where they get to, to one or more so-called uh, significant quantities, as you know, which is the quantity for which, as, the, as the, um, uh, the terminology indicates, for which the you know, development of a nuclear weapon cannot be excluded. And that depends on the uh, levels of enrichment. That depends on whether you're talking of, about plutonium or enriched uranium. So uh, this is going to happen. Um, uh, of course, having uh, an SQ, as we call them, does not mean having a bomb. That's a very important. Uh, of course, it's it, it's not um, uh, it's not a banality. It's a very very important uh, thing, uh, and of course, uh, we we expect this to be an important development in the process in general. Uh, but again, that emphasizes and stresses the importance of uh, for us to continue to have as much access uh, for the inspectors as we can have, uh, which is already problematic, and we will see what happens with that. So, so it's, it's, it's not if, it's, it's, it's <coughs> just a matter of time. That's there what are, you're saying. There are people if who say that already, already now. They have a significant or two. You know, different people have different calculations. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's very close, let's put it like that, but this idea that you are about to, to cross a line which is going to create a uh, dramatically different situation. I wouldn't say so because it's going to happen anyway. They're very close anyway. They're very, very close. So uh, uh, and uh, for all we can say and see, the development of new uh, uh, centrifuges uh, continue in Iran, which means that they want to have technology to produce more and faster. So it cannot be avoided anymore? Do you see any way how this can be avoided? 
that the, the, that the fact that, the, that uh, Iran can reach this, however you want to qualify that threshold level, um, can, can this be well, avoided? Well, Iran can stop doing what they are doing, and they can stop doing that uh, through different means. One can be by, the, by an agreement, for example, like the JCPOA, or by they themselves uh, deciding to, to slow down. Uh, hello, DJ Gurusi. Hello. Uh, I am Samadi from Iran International TV. Hello. Uh, Tehran has threatened uh, <coughs> any resolution in the yes. Board of Governors, even today. Yes. Uh, will have consequences for who push the resolution. My question is, how much can these threat uh, affect IAEA's decisions, the activities, and cooperation with Iran? <coughs> And second question is about your uh, reports. You, in, your, in your report, you told uh, uh, there is no transparency in Iran's answers. Could you tell more detail about the Iran's answers to your questions? <coughs> Thank you. Well, the answers, um, we, we, we have uh, received some answers, but uh, they, they, they tend to be, as, I, as we said, technically you know, not credible. They are telling us. Uh, I wouldn't get into too technical details, but to give you a flair of what this could be, they explain the presence of certain particles in a way which uh, our assessment indicates that cannot be the answer. So uh, when that happens, we try to go back, as you would do in a normal dialogue or, or process, let's say. And uh, we are, uh, you know, the, the sometimes the story changes a little bit, or sometimes they tell us that's, that it's because of a sabotage by a third party, which again is not technically possible because of the nature, the spread, the, the different varieties of isotopic uh, um, particles that have been found. So we have told them uh, this is not, uh, it, cannot, it doesn't explain. What we found cannot be explained in this way. So this is a bit where we are in a, in a, in a sort of uh, impasse or, uh, I don't know, uh, circle uh, where, from which we have to go out. We, we need to, uh, to, to bring the conversation to a different level where we will have real, the engagement is there, but there's no result. So, and the cooperation, going back to your question, I would say the cooperation can always be better, can always be deeper. But at the same time, let's not forget that there is a minimum of cooperation that must exist for as long as Iran continues to be uh, uh, a signatory of the NPT and has a comprehensive safe gas agreement uh, in, in place. So uh, it's a matter of uh, graduation, it's a matter of uh, uh, intensity and effectiveness of the uh, verification uh, process. Going to the issue again of the um, threat or the consequences of the colleague um, uh, was uh, asking uh, before, uh, for me, it's, I, I, mean, I, I don't think I should be speculating what's going to happen. I, I hope that all that is going to happen is that, that as a result of the deliberations of the board uh, this week, we will come out of this uh, with a sense of commitment to solve this thing one, once and for all. Because as I said, this is not going to disappear. Uh, this is always going to be there and it's in the interest of Iran in the first place to clarify it. Anna Sauerbrei for the German Die Zeit. Um, I would like to follow up on what uh, Frau Lichtenstein asked. Um, you said uh, Iran is very, very close to um, building a bomb or a, um, no, no, a having a significant uh, having, quantity. Uh, having a significant quantity of material. Having yes. a bomb is a different thing. I know. Please. Yes. But uh, could you put a figure to that? So you said different experts have different. It's a matter of weeks, maybe. It's a matter of weeks or maybe a, a short month or two months. It depends. I, I, I don't like, uh, you know, here at the agency, we are very meticulous in our calculations. And sometimes we see some analysts, NGOs and analysts that come up with calculations. Basically, you know, based on what they are assessing without being there. We are there, so we have the very, I would say, heavy responsibility to, to try to be very precise. And this may vary because sometimes there are technical problems as well 
with the cascades, and so there is a there is a deceleration or, or there is a slowdown or there is an acceleration. But to give you the idea that it is it is something that uh, uh, will will happen, they will reach a, a significant quantity. In general, if you take all the material that they that they have. If you put it to, if you were to put it together, to bundle it together, there is already a significant quantity. Uh, give and take a little bit because you can, you may lose a bit of material in the process, but more or less. Uh, uh, but uh, so and, uh, and since they are continuing with the process, well then it's a matter of of just uh, a, a few weeks. Let's say, let's put it like that. Uh, thank you. Hello. Hussein Abdurrahman. Uh, I would like to ask about your visit to Israel. To yes. Back to the visit. Uh, if you can walk us through the details, what have you talked to them about that they haven't signed the MPT, mm -hmm. that this makes it not, they don't have the right to talk or to make such big noise since they are not really uh, part of this uh, agreement. Yes. This is one thing. The second thing is, is a, a technical question about is members obliged to not to enrich uranium since they are doing it under the supervision of the agency and the inspectors are there? If, if it is not a secret thing. No, not you mean in Iran, the enrichment? Yeah, I mean, I, no, I, it's I, not I, a secret. General, but, uh, it's not Iran, a secret. Of course, is in, in my mind. Yeah. Thank you. No, that's not. It's, uh, first, to start with, if I understood correctly what you wanted to know, the enrichment activities that are taking place uh, in Iran, we are aware of. We are following them. We are inspecting them. This is this is how we can say how much material and for for the different uh, uh, isotopic concentrations uh, is. Okay, so that is one one thing. On the issue of Israel, you know, I talk, I, it's very important as the Director General of the IEA, I talk to everybody. I must, I must. Uh, so I cannot talk to some and not to others. Uh, it's the same thing that I'm doing with Ukraine and it's the same thing that I'm, do, I'm doing here. On the contrary, one would say that it's very, very important that the head of an international organization has an opportunity to talk to those that are um, uh, that have a, a special interest or that are saying important things about it and could influence one way or the other. So this is why I was there to say, let the IAEA work, the inspection work can yield good results if we have the access that we need uh, from Iran, and this for me has a tremendous value, a positive value in the sense that what I am protecting here is the ability to continue my work, to continue my work without any external factors that could uh, affect it. So I feel it is really my responsibility to do that. I talked to them about Iran, but, but what about them themselves, about that is Israel to allow inspecting uh, inspections in its land, in this... As you know, is, is, I, I, I would, uh, and I think I said it in my public uh, communications about this, I believe that every country should sign the NPT, including Israel, including Israel, and have all the nuclear facilities and installations under the safeguards of the IAEA, all right? So uh, I don't have a power to force a country to do something. Uh, Israel is, an, is, not, is one of the few countries in the world, as you know, but it's not the only one. Uh, there are other important countries that have chosen not to sign the NPT, all right? So they are part of that, they are, they are in that group. Uh, still, I, th I think it was important that, that uh, my message would be clear um, in, this, in this sense, that for me it would be uh, very, very important. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think I can add anything else, um, frankly. Uh, it is important that the voice of the agency is heard everywhere. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question about the report uh, regarding the open questions with Iran. In the report and also in previous reports, it was uh, spelled out the, that one of the open questions uh, regards uh, 
the uh, regards uh, a neutron detector and the possible presence of neutrons at one of the sites. Yeah. Um, why, why did you mention this or, or how does this fit into your investigation? I'm asking because in the, in the very few years ago in a report, uh, the IA said that basically their conclusion was, or assessment was that the uh, Iran had worked on, on elements of a nuclear weapons program. So how does that, how does a neutron detector fit into that? Well, it is related to that we have, we have information and uh, we, n and, uh, subsequent to, to getting that information, which was not present at the time where, we, where the agency um, had that assessment, uh, uh, uranium uh, particles were found um, uh, at the place. So everything is part of a mosaic, if you want, um, that uh, lead us to put certain questions. And the fact of the matter is that when you look at it, uh, it is obvious that when the agency normally has an impression that there is something to be asked, then uh, the facts prove that we were aiming more or less right because we, we found uh, these particles in this particular place. And, some, and something else, uh, which is also a recurrent uh, issue, we have assessments that uh, correspond to the information we have at a certain moment. Um, uh, the agency never uh, closes anything forever. If there is more information arriving and, and we look at it and we see that it's relevant, for, in, for example, in, the, in this case, uh, which uh, applies to Marivan, uh, then we ask more questions on the basis of, uh, of this information we have. Well, as you know, this, these systems are relevant for uh, non-peaceful purposes. Hi, DG, uh, Nippon Television Network. Um, actually, I want to ask two questions. Yes. Can I do that? Yes, you can. <laughs> OK. okay. Uh, <coughs> One is about the Ukraine. Um, you mentioned about the um, appeal from the uh, the president of the Ukraine that you know he's appealing to UN and to you yes. to do that. Um, now that this does that ch sort of change the character or the members uh, consist consist uh, constellation of the mission mm -hmm. um, because now it's more like a multinational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So, can you clarify yeah. if yeah. that changes? And question number two is the uh, treaty uh, uh, first treaty conference of the uh, nuclear ban <coughs> yeah. treaty is taking place at the end of this month. Yes. Uh, are you, is IAEA going to have anybody representing? Thank you. Well, uh, uh, on on the first uh, question. Um, uh, or the second, sorry, the, the, um, uh, the, this conference is a conference on a, on a treaty uh, which uh, deals with something different than what uh, is in my mandate, right? So we all recognize the importance of uh, global nuclear disarmament, which I think is, is a goal that uh, the international community as such has embraced and it is present in the treaty on the non-proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons. So uh, most probably we will have a representative there as an observer to, to follow that. But we don't have a formal role um, in, that, um, uh, in that process. And the first part was, sorry? Um, about the, the, how that's going to change if the UN gets involved. Ah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, of course, I must say that whatever, whatever we would do, uh, at uh, Zaporizhia is something that uh, the agency alone is going to be doing when it comes to safeguards or uh, safety or security activities. Um, this is part of our legal uh, relationship with uh, Ukraine. So we cannot uh, invite others, uh, third parties to. But there has been uh, some discussion. I cannot reveal everything because I'm still in the process of uh, consulting uh, with uh, Ukraine. 
uh, and also Russia, uh, that there could be some international presence to add on to the, to the team going there. I would uh, kindly ask you to excuse me because we are in the middle of a, of a negotiation uh, about that. But um, uh, what I want to assure you is that whatever we are going to be doing there would be uh, uh, exclusively um, carried out by our uh, inspectors. And there is a lot, there is a lot uh, that would need to be done. Now, what we are trying to do is we are looking at what we call the modalities. What are the modalities? Who comes? Who is there? How we do it? There is, of course, as you know, this uh, facility is uh, in a relatively unstable, not to say uh, directly dangerous uh, territory because it's quite close to the to the theater of uh, operations at the moment. So uh, in order for me and uh, for my technical experts to reach the place, we need the UN involvement, and Secretary General Guterres has been following that. I'm very grateful to him because we are in regular contact, and he is providing support with armored vehicles and, and other things. So I hope to be able to report positive news in the next few days about that. Thank you. One final question. From yes. Sorry, just to follow up on, on, on Israel. Um, uh, Israeli Defense Minister Bennett, Benny Gantz recently talked about um, facilities being built uh, underground abut and abutting Natanz. Um, I'm just wondering if you could tell us what. Well, what this is, I don't know about what, uh, what uh, Minister Gantz said, but this is no secret. As you know, the then president of the uh, Atomic Energy Organization of Iran. Dr. Salehi himself uh, informed that uh, Iran was going to uh, build more uh, underground facilities to install uh, some um, uh, centrifuges, basically, or some other some other things. So we we know that this this work is ongoing. So it's not it's nothing new. Okay, so this is the this is the tunneling sort of in the hills near Natanz that had been yeah. reported. So abutting yeah. is a bit of an exaggeration. It's a little. It's like, I don't want to comment away. on what he's had to say, but the reality is that, yes, there is work on this stuff. Okay. Thank, so Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.